This is the Faith in Real Life podcast with author and pastor Nat Crawford and co-lead pastor Dan Koch. Let's tackle real issues in the culture and in life with the truths of Scripture. And now here's Nat and Dan. Welcome to the Faith in Real Life podcast. I'm your host, Nat Crawford, and I'm here with my special guest, Kevin Lewis. Kevin is the president of the Institute of Theology and Law. And not only that, he was one of my professors when I was at Biola. So if you don't like my theology, you can blame <laughs> him. It is his fault. <laughs> There it is. Kevin. Well, I'm not responsible. I don't think you drank the Kool-Aid when you were there, so I'm not responsible <laughs> once you graduated. But we'll, there is some Kool-Aid I can give you that will keep you orthodox. So, uh, well, hey, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's been interesting, um, you know, as as moving from primarily a Bible teacher uh, on the on, you know, radio and online to back to being a pastor. There, there is a very challenging reality of learning about theology, learning the Bible, and then actually standing firm and applying it. Right? I mean, there, there. That's where you the rubber meets the road. Well, that's right. I mean, as in a, that's that's the problem which we could talk about for days. But days. The reality is, is that the most important academic practitioner profession is to be a pastor. And this is why if you actually look at um, post-Reformation Protestantism, you look at that, who became a pastor? I mean, you had to get minimally a master's degree, but most of the pastors ended up with a doctor of divinity or something. Mm. Why? Because eternal consequences are far more important than temporal consequences. Right. You have people getting juris doctorates to practice law. Why? Because legal consequences are important. You you have people with medical doctorates, you know, to, to help people heal illnesses and injuries. And why? Because it's important that we base, you know, running real life on truth and what's true and what's right and what good, that, that important trifecta. Right. But in a postmodern world, see now pastors don't have to have truth and knowledge. They're just, you know, happiness facilitators at some point. Right. So this is why we, you know, even more so when you have a culture that's suffering from modernism, postmodernism and skepticism, that we have pastors that are equipped not only with the gospel, with theology, but know, know how to apply it. How do we're in this to fix people's sin problems? The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Very interesting. There's four chapters in the Bible that deal with human beings in a state of perfection and perfect justice. And it's the first two and the last two. Mm -hmm. And everything in between is all about fixing the sin problem with the human mm -hmm. race. Right. And the number one problem with the human race is that both angels, which will lead us into our demonology, angels and human beings have subsets of them that are in rebellion against God. Right. And because right. we're in rebellion against the moral law of God and his holiness, it creates harm to relationships with God and each other. So right. there's suffering, there's death. Uh, and for human beings, what are we, you know, we're uh, we're guilty, we're alienated and we're corrupt. And right. we're in a state of eternal death and spiritual death because of our sin. But today being, you know, Good Friday. I mean, literally what we have is, uh, you know, the this is why Christ came. I mm -hmm. did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. Right. The entire purpose of the incarnation of the God man was to, in fact, die spiritually and physically to make a satisfaction sufficient to pay for everyone's sins. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Amen. Amen. And as you can see, this guy's had a profound impact on me because I pretty much just copy and paste everything you said and put it into my sermon. So thank you so much, no. Kevin. But a no. couple of things we want to talk about today with you. We want to talk about demons and angels. We want to talk talk about the Bible and we want to talk about abortion. So let's just start with okay. de demons and angels. So the culture today, though they are very skeptical of God and we have a lot of atheists in the world today, there seems to be a hyper interest in, in the supernatural demons and and so to somewhat degree angels but i mean you got all these movies the conjuring and insidious and i mean people are just obsessed with demons so i guess the first question is do demons exist and if so how, how can we know that to be true okay on that issue on whether they exist and and so forth i will back up to your your note of people's interest in this people have always had an interest in the supernatural hmm. And this is why, I mean, you read through the Bible, I mean, from the beginning to the end, 
what you see is what, what's important is that even in the Old New Testament, what what was the result of all the people who rejected Yahweh, the true and the living God? They didn't go off and become atheists and skeptics, which, by the way, are the, the very smallest percentage of a worldview in human history is atheism. Hmm. The people who believe that we're nothing more than cosmic space dust that accidentally hmm. clumped together somehow. OK, yeah. that just no, that's just everyone knows that's nonsense. Also, the very fact that in reality, we're more than our bodies. Uh, mm. Being made in the image of God and with substance dualism, we're body, soul, spirit. We exist in two realms or uh, dimensions simultaneously. There are a number of ways to state this. Why? Because we have a spiritual substance exemplified by the soul, which is the ground of our personhood, and we can act and be acted upon in the spiritual world. And mm. we, again, we have a, a physical substance exemplified by the body that can act and be acted upon in the physical world or physical dimension or realm. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is that no matter how much people tell you, you're nothing more than your body and how much, you know, at the forefront of your mind, you're trying to push down this idea of spiritual reality, you know, it's real. Right. Just like, you know, every atheist, you mention God and they get, you know, hypersensitive to the notion of God. Why? Because they know they're guilty. Mm -hmm. No right. matter how much you pretend God, a lawgiver doesn't exist you still know you're guilty and you fear death. Right. There's a so that's of why we see this interest, the interest of, you know, people being feeling this sense of guilt, knowing that there really is a sense of eternity in the afterlife. They reach out knowing that spirituality is real, but they're looking for safe spirituality mm -hmm. and safe spirituality is the world of the occult, which you see all throughout the old and the new Testament. Every hmm. false religion mentioned in the Old and New Testament is basically, it, it's a magical polytheistic worldview. Hmm. And what we're seeing within the, now that Christianity has allegedly been discredited by modernism and postmodernism and contemporary skepticism and atheism and so forth in secular culture, people know that atheism doesn't satisfy, it doesn't provide a foundation for uh, normative moral ethics. It doesn't provide a foundation. So people say, no, there's gotta be something more. Mm -hmm. But I don't want judgmental spirituality uh, uh, that has to control me. So you go right back to the world of the occult right. where magic and divination and spiritism as the three branches of practices magic or, or sorcery, if I can get enough, get the secrets of how to get enough power, mm -hmm. then I can affect the myself and the world around me to get exactly what I want. Mm -hmm. Or with divination, fortune telling, all the areas, those have to do with knowledge. If I can get enough knowledge, I can control myself and the people and the world around me. Right. Or spiritism, or if I, I can't get the knowledge and power directly, I can ask indirectly, ask some spirit to do it for me or give me the knowledge. Right. But it's all about right back to Genesis 3, the day you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. The attraction of that promise is, is that you will have power and knowledge to make your own destiny. Hmm. And that has been the, 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 the template for false religion ever since. Right. It's not repentance. And seeking uh, our, our our rightful creator and master who loves us and is majestic and glorified and wise and really wants our, where we, oh, really, God, you're, you're right. I shouldn't be doing this. And you know what's best for me. Thanks for letting me know. Mm -hmm. No, it's the rebellion, both by angels and humans. Mm -hmm. No, I still want to be my own God. I still want to do that, which is right in my own eyes. And therefore, you see, for example, the Church of Satan, they follow the law of Thelema, the Greek word for will, which is mm. do what you will. There's mm. one law in Satanism, do whatever you want to do because you are your own God. Uh, in uh, some neo-pagan uh, religions like Wicca, the, their Wiccan read, R-E-D-E, or their, uh, their one principle, as long as you harm none, do what you will. Mm -hmm. Who gets to decide what harm is? The individual Wiccan. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean? Do what you will. So you get past all this, you get to the point of what's it about with power? And so what you end up with is this biblical worldview where you have these fallen, hateful angels. You know, they have an angel nature and they hate God and they hate us. 
And I do a whole three unit semester course on this topic. So there's lots to say. But I, I just say that the summary statement of all the biblical data, in my opinion, is fallen angels live essentially the same way that fallen human beings live hmm. in the sense that right now, you look on Earth right now, how many billions, there's about 8 billion human beings. How mm -hmm. many of them are true, repentant, born-again Christians, percentage-wise? Oh, not, be... probably not, not many. Yeah, Even, very small. Maybe 1%. Sure. I mean, look, just look within the church of those self people who self-identify as Christian. Oh, yeah. How many are really and truly born again? Ton of false now, look at that, though, but God, the wages of sin is death, and God does not take their life immediately. They're allowed to sin as we are. God permits us within his permissive will to disobey his express normative moral will every day mm -hmm. by act omission. But yet he doesn't require that death penalty, which is the wages of sin right now. It's postponed. Now, there are agencies and governances uh, where, for example, God sets up human government to, to a sense, of restrain sin, just like he sets up the family and the church to restrain sin, mm -hmm. uh, and also to, you know, encourage for righteousness and training in righteousness and so on and so forth. But um, what you see is people get to sin every day and they don't get that death penalty. They get to live in a state of sinning every day as long as they don't commit certain sins. Hmm. which we call crimes. And if you get a crime, you get a timeout, you go, you get jail time. And if you commit, you used to, right? Right. And if you get a capital crime, you get a permanent timeout. You don't get to play mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. And you see some of these glimpses with the demonic world, like, have you come to torment us before the day? Hmm. Asking permission to go into the, you know, uh, the garrison demoniac. Hey, let us go into that herd of pigs over there and make the first batch of devil's ham, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Ah, uh -huh. nice. Well, okay, well played. Got so, but so there seems to be, yeah, demons are fallen angels who get to freely operate in sin until a certain time where there's going to be a final judgment. And one of the sad things is they do, they have been interacting with the human race since Genesis 3. Yeah. Where we see the first fallen angel, Lucifer, who in uh, uh, the book of Revelation, it says, you know, the serpent, you know, uh, you know, the devil, the serpent of old, you know, and so on and so forth that, or just as the serpent deceived Eve with his craftiness, mm -hmm. your minds have been led astray, hmm. the simplicity and purity and devotion to Christ. So yeah, the first fallen angel, again, they're still around and they do the kinds of things that demons can do. And their main issue, according to John 8, 44, according to Jesus, he's a liar. Satan is a liar and a murderer from beginning and abode not in the truth. Hmm. And if you look at what the most common activity of demons is with the human race is they're convincing con artists and liars. Hmm. And hmm. even though, you know, when you start getting these other things that they can do to fool people, Part of it is, you know, can they manipulate the physical world? Yeah, I mean, we know they can possess people. Uh, you look at the entire range of what an angel can do with an angel nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though, yeah, Michael Heiser's stuff on the unseen realm and demons and everything, he seems to, he seems to posit that there there's more than one type of created spirit other than angels. But... When all is said and done, uh, I don't hold to that. There's some people who are thinking about that. But when all that's said and done, even if there are others that are different from this class of being called angels, in the end, they're spirits without bodies, created uh, in the image of God with moral accountability to God. And you're probably going to have some of them that are elect and follow God and the other ones that hate God and are going to rebel against God and try and interact with the human race. So what kind so, of power do what kind of power do demons have over people and more more specifically Christians? Do they have any authority or power over us? Can they possess us? Okay. Well, and that's where when you get into the, you have to distinguish the concept of authority and power and that's one of the biggest issues with uh when you think about power, for example, let's start with God is omnipotent. Hmm. One of his attributes or things we can predicate or say about God is God is all powerful. Well, the very concept of power, biblically and metaphysically, is the capacity of a thing or being to produce an effect. 
and effects are generally uh, relegated into two, two categories, motion and mutation. You can either move something or change something. Mm. So an omnipotent being can, in fact, and this is who God is, God can bring to effect all that is logically possible. Mm -hmm. See, that's what omnipotence is. And so now you think about that in the concept of a capacity of a being or thing to produce an effect, the greater the, you know, the greater the, the being, the greater the power, the greater effect it can produce. Like right mm -hmm. now, you know, I can pick up my cell phone, which weighs what, half a pound, mm -hmm. but I can't pick up my car. See, that would require greater power to oh. produce the greater effect, the great, you know, mo the, the greater movement or the greater motion or something. So this is why. So when we conceive of power, it's the capacity. And even then, then we have to think about the, you know, 15 levels of causation that are mm. involved with the final one being efficient causation, that it's direct and immediate and actually it produces the effect. Mm. OK, that's why, for example, when you look at the differences of Calvinist, Arminians, Lutherans and so forth, one of the things in Reformed theology or Calvinist theology, well, it's sometimes called irresistible grace it's more appropriately uh labeled e efficacious or efficient grace because mm -hmm. it's the grace god gives that actually produces the effect of salvation right when god regenerates you he just produced the effect of salvation right nothing's going to undo it mm -hmm. so that's why we look at that you know the idea of power authority uh is really the the concept of having the the right to command and demand obedience. Mm -hmm. Power is the ability to enforce it. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, again, the, clear, the, the clearest example of authority that people understand is if, you know, you see this occasionally now, your traffic lights go out, you see a local police officer standing in the middle of the intersection with a whistle and a, a white glove that looks like, right, Michael Jackson's white glove. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, they put their hand up and say, you know, stop. Mm -hmm. Well, a 200 pound man or 150 pound wo woman has no power to stop a 2000 pound moving car. Hmm. They can't. Right. See, so that so, yeah, not power, but what they have is authority. They have the right to command you to stop. Now, when you recognize that the police officer represents, you know, a rightful authority, which they're an agent of a rightful authority and the ultimate rightful authority, the state, mm -hmm. which ultimately see if you don't stop. That's when we send in, you know, multiple cars, the SWAT team, we hunt you down. And then we physically block your car with multiple vehicles. And then we drag you out and swarm you. Yeah. So because you didn't voluntarily comply with a lawful command with lawful authority under your own power, you needed a direct application of power to make you do what you were commanded to do. Hmm. See, that's the difference between power and authority. So when you think about spiritual warfare and things like that, Human beings, or just Christians, born again, true born again Christians, seated in the heavenlies with Christ, do not have any quote unquote power over the devil. And this is important too, because in the Bible, the word that's translated power uh, in the Greek New Testament, exousia, is also the same word translated as authority. Mm -hmm. That's why you see, you know, mm -hmm. certain translations of John one twelve. As many as received him, to them they gave the right, you know, to become the children of God or the authority to become the children of God. So ex exousia can become power, right, or authority depending on mm -hmm. the context. Right. Yeah. Just like you know, uh, other terms like vindication can also be justification depending on the context. Mm -hmm. So, so in this case, yeah, Christians have authority because we're children of God because we're we we are agents now of Yahweh the true and the living God we're part of his kingdom we have that rightful Christ is seated as the Messiah at the right hand of God and we are his agents seated next to him spiritually in heavenly places therefore we have the right to command demons hmm. and that's when you get to Again, very important. The Bible is not a book of angel and demons. The statements about angels in the Bible, particularly, they're all incidental to God's story of saving the human race. 
Right. Yes. They have their own, you know, uh, angel elect angels never fell. So they don't need a salvation plan. And every individual angel that chose not to remain in relationship with God did it individually mm-hmm. and decided they just didn't want it. They right. did not want a relationship with God. As such, God honors their request. And, you know, they, but none of them are, are banging on the door of heaven saying, I want back in <laughs> and I want to be righteous. Just like right now, you, you open up the prison doors, you know, with convicted felons. They're not running to church confessing their sins. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So that gets into, you know, eschatological concerns and what happens in the afterlife. So, so when you get to this idea of, okay, what's rational versus irrational evil? See, right now, you know, if, if, if a criminal sees a cop saying stop, a rational criminal stops because they know that that agent represents greater power and authority and they're going to, there's going to be even greater consequences if they don't obey. Mm hmm. But what does irrational evil do? They disobey. Mm-hmm. So the bank robber, you know, all of a sudden gets confronted by the cop in the bank, you know, and, and they drop their weapons and comply and so forth. The irrational criminal does what? No, they shoot the cop and then think they can hold up in the bank and, you know, get past the helicopters and the SWAT team and, and everything else and outsmart everybody. And eventually, again, what happens is, you see the direct application of force. So you, I think what you find in the scriptures is that, you know, these passages like, you know, the 70 come back, hey, even the demons are subject to us in your name, mm-hmm. right? And then you have other passages that say, hey, we tried to cast this demon out and it wouldn't leave. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's because this kind only come out by prayer. And then there's a, a alternative reading on that that adds and fasting. Mm-hmm. Why? And I think there's an easy criminal law explanation of that is one is a rational demon. The other is irrational huh. is that that particular demon wouldn't obey a lawful order from an agent of Yahweh. Mm-hmm. And at that point, what they had to do is whether it's direct application of power by the Holy Spirit or, you know, there's Michael, the archangel or some other more powerful angel that we don't know how applied power to souls and spirits works. Mm-hmm. in the spiritual world but apparently it does mm-hmm. and apparently there's there's something that resembles movement right you know in the spiritual world because if you can if you can have a legion of demons in the garrison gathering demoniac that moves across a field into a herd of pigs somehow they can stop their you know connection with and relation with and their in local spiritual presence with manifestation in nature with and relation with that human nature in the possession, they can move and now be connected with and manifest that present in some other type of being thing or place. Sure. Yeah. So that's, so that's the difference between power and authority mm-hmm. and how that's going to work. And of course, when demons have no duty to obey non-Christians, Hmm. That's again, we see that, you know, the book of Acts, we see the seven sons of Sceva, right? The Jewish exorcist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I adjure you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. The demon says, well, (laughs) I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And he beats (laughs) him up and throws him out of the house. And fortunately, this is, you know, as you and I as pastors think about, yeah, the the, the term in Jesus name, a lot, too many Christians today, it's it's, it's not the magic words we say at the end of the prayer Mm -hmm. to get our prayers answered. It means that, you know, the name represents the person in authority, in likeness, in being, in character, and all these things. So we pray in Jesus' name. We're saying, hey, we want to pray like Jesus would pray. Right. More alignment yeah. to him and his will and his yeah. character. Sure. But when you that get to, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, it's like saying stop in the name of the law. Right. You're naming the ultimate power and authority of which you are an agent. Right. So, I mean, we're talking about the Bible here, and so I want to transition because obviously the Bible talks about demons and them being real. But, okay, the Bible today. I mean, you look at any um, survey out there, Gallup, Pew Research, fewer and fewer Christians today hold to the Bible as authoritative, inerrant, infallible. And a lot of them today are saying it's not even God's word. So if someone comes up to you and says, the Bible 
Is it God's word? Okay. And, and yeah, and again, to back up a little bit, when you say even Christians say today, <laughs> you really have to clarify, well, people who self-identify as Christian, that that's a big range of stuff. I mean, you have, you have self-identified Christians that are practical atheists. Correct. That are, you know, uh, at, at the time of Christ, how many people in, in Judaism, right, you know, thought that they were true Jews? Mm-hmm. Where in the end, it was a very small percentage that ended up, you know, uh, coming to Christ and coming to, in the end, to, you know, in fact, all of John 8, what what uh, precedes Jesus' statement, no, you're of your father, the devil, mm-hmm. is you have these people who say, well, we're of the children of Abraham. We've never been this. We're this and that. No, you're children of the devil. Mm-hmm. Your self-identification as a, as a follower of Judaism is just false. Right. And even the leaders themselves, no, you're, you're, you're rotting corpses with pearly white coffins around yourself. You're, you are the devil, you're snakes, right? You know, you're, you're, you're all these things. So the problem comes with the word Christians say, well, so when you get into what that means, it's probably is, is this is why we need to do regular Bible theology and apologetics in the church Hmm. is that people have reasons to believe that we exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict Titus one nine. And even in the mo- in the best of the last hundred years of fundamental evangelical Protestantism, most of the best we've done in the best churches is we have regular Bible, which not a lot of regular ethics and theology and almost no apologetics. Mm-hmm. So right. you get a lot of people who know what kind of bricks Nehemiah used to build the wall, but they can't they don't know what to do when when mom's in hospice and when to pull the plug. They right. don't know why the Bible's inspired when their kid goes into a philosophy class their first semester in college. And here's, you know, three hours of anti-Christian rant. And not only the mom and dad, but the pastor are like, well, just pray about it. They're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So right. so we're right back to that is, you know, the problem is, is the lack of education and the problematic philosophy of ministry that goes on in the local church that we're not equipping the saints. Right, for I agree. the work of ministry in contemporary culture, we're mm-hmm. not even really a, a, equipping them to keep their own faith, much less reach anybody else. Right. Yep. So when we start to say that, it's like, okay, well, uh, and again, and I, I turn to people too. I have a for the Institute of Theology and Law, we have a YouTube page, and I'm I've got about halfway done uploading all of my theology and Bible and Scripture lectures for this, and it's actually real worth yeah. your time. Yeah, so I have almost my entire uh, Bible scripture lectures on what it means that the Bible's inspired, and then the proofs of inspiration, the challenges hmm. to the Bible that we're facing today. That's that's virtually you know, we have introduction to theology, prolegomena, and after that, it's, it's it's several hours of lecture on how what inspiration, inerrancy, canonicity, uh, translation, all these things are, but also. What is proof, the nature of proof, and how you can know that the Bible really is inspired? So we go back to what does it mean that the Bible is inspired? And because this is just, these are basics, but they're not taught by and large in the local church. Right. Inspiration, the Bible defines it as, you know, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is, you know, God's all God's word is theopneustas, theopneustas, God breathed. Mm-hmm, which which right. the Latin is inspirare, breathe in. Mm. And it doesn't mean that God has breath, you know, and he's out, you know. What it means is the words on the page, all scripture is inspired by God. Correct. And the scripture, the graphe, the writings, not mm-hmm. the apostles are inspired, the writings are God breathed. And so the very words on the page are God's words. Now we start with God is the ultimate authority. God is the ultimate sort of truth. God has the ultimate authority to com- and, and right to command our conscience and demand our obedience. Hmm. So by connecting this book with God, it's saying there, that you have to do that to make the words on the page and the meanings and the propositions authoritative and binding. Right. Well, that's why people say, well, what about alleged errors? What about this? Well, we, we can deal with Bible difficulties all you want, but what are the evidences going to be for inspiration? Right. See, and I cover that in my lectures and, well, evidences for inspiration. Well, how about that you have, you know, 
a vastly, vastly different religion in the middle of this pagan human sacrifice, magical polytheism in the Middle East. Hmm. That, how, you know, it's just, where'd that come from? How about that it comports completely with human reason, like the Kalam cosmological argument, teleological arguments. It, it, it literally answers every human need and, and human question of, we know a personal powerful being caused the universe to come into existence a limited amount of time ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, that's just overwhelming evidence for that. Yep. Based on all we know, there's overwhelming evidence that there's, uh, 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 you know, moral absolutism as opposed to moral relativism, that yep. there's, um, again, there's a number of other ways to state that, but the bottom is everybody knows there's a natural moral law. Everybody knows it, it's, it's wrong to torture babies for fun. <laughs> right. But there's got to be a ground for that. Hence an immutable, holy moral being. Right. You know, design arguments, you know, working eyeballs didn't come together from, you know, a, a, a dust storm. Right. You know, so it, this all just but the Bible itself. But yes, there's a single mono, monotheistic creator who, can, you know, is the eternal one who brought the limited non-eternal creation into being. And it shows purpose, and morality and all this. And so you can start going through this and the longing that the ultimate is love. The ultimate is mm. not solitude. The ultimate is love. All the other religions are, are having you escape God's cosmic prison, but you never know God. Right. It's for you to continue back to Genesis 3 and be your own God. I just escaped the consequences of my sin, so I continue to do what I want to do. Yep. Yep. Instead of acknowledging God. So by the time you're done, you end up with, look, there are things, everything from prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy is huge because only God, who knows the future and is providentially guiding it, can actually give accurate predictions of the future. Yep. And he's 100% right 100% of the time, which is exactly what the Old Testament uh, says. Look, if they're not right 100% of the time, one. And two, all, all, all of the prophets don't lead you back to Yahweh in repentance. They're false prophets. Mm-hmm. So when you start looking at the inspiration and authority of the Bible, you have to start with, there's no meaning to that unless we have a, a self-existing eternal God that is the ultimate source of knowledge and authority for inspiration to even mean anything. Hmm. Wow. But the, the general argument that we should have something like the Bible is say, look, well, now that you're starting with, you know, natural law and philosophy and, you know, your five basic ways for the proofs of God. All right. So now we have this eternal, um, really smart, uh, powerful, loving, moral creator. OK. Um, who and now he made us to be aware of him. Well, since we know God is good, what should we expect from God in a fallen world? Instruction on how to make it better. Hmm. And that's exactly why we should expect something like the Bible from God on how to fix the sin problem. Hmm. So when you come down to it, and all the other religions, dualism, polytheism, pantheism, they're all just, they, they, they don't even meet the basic test of, you know, how to understand reality as it is, that there is, you know, unless you get to monotheism, all the, like pantheism, everything is God. That means you're God too. Great. How is it I forgot I was God and now I have to chant to remember I'm God so I can be extinguished as a spark of God? Right. So you get it. And then, oh, okay, well, there's many gods that are limited beings. Great. How they cause the universe to come into existence. Hmm. So they all fail. I mean, in their basic ontology and metaphysic. So you get to the three basic monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, Unitarianism and deism are insufficient in and of itself as philosophies. But when you get to the religions based on that, uh, you know, Judaism, biblical Judaism is just is just that it's incomplete Christianity. Mm. Uh, and Islam, it, you know, it claims that the Old and New Testament were corrupt and that's why they needed the last prophet. But they don't actually provide a way of redemption through God's own self-sacrifice. Right. It's the pillars of Islam. If you do enough works to make up for your bad works. So yep. Islam is wrong because, no, 
the Bible's not corrupt. Jesus didn't just swoon on the cross and here on Good Friday. No, he really did die on the cross. And three days mm-hmm. later, Resurrection Sunday, he rose from the dead, demonstrating not his power in this and that, which a lot of apologists, he demonstrated that God is finished punishing the substitute so that the satisfaction for sin is complete. The wages yes. of sin is death. Therefore, Christ didn't sin. Therefore, he could take the death penalty for us. And if he's still dead, he's still being punished. Mm-hmm. It's not the, the punishment is not completely satisfied yet. The mm. fact that he comes back to life says sentence complete, paid in full. So resurrection is evidence of what Paul said. If Christ is not risen, our faith is empty. We're still in our sins. Right. Because the debt is still being paid and it's not complete yet for a yep. substitute. That's why Resurrection Sunday is so important is because that's the proof that, wow, God himself sent the substitute, which was the second person of the Trinity with a full human nature, never ceasing to be God, who lives the perfect life, dies spiritually and physically in our place. And then, you know, and then now makes full satisfaction, propitiation for sin so that all that's left for us to do, because God himself has borne the harm and penalty for sin, is for us to reconcile with God is to now repent, confess our sins and go through the transaction of trusting God in the act of reconciliation in faith. Hmm. There's no fear involved. Yeah, I think I'm going to take what you just said and just play it for my Sunday. Fully said. Beautifully well, said. Yeah, it's why they, uh, well, they never really paid me the big bucks as a theologian. Uh, <laughs> as my brother well, always tells me, that's why, yeah, y- y- your spiritual bank account in heaven is big when you know this stuff and can share it. Come out so, to Nebraska. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get you some physical cash as well. Yeah, so there we'll, you go. we'll get you out here. No. So, explain. Well, you, the Bible is God's word. And again, in a short time, you know, a short, you know, interview like this, the point is to even say that it's God's word. You have to define that very carefully. You have to have a God who exists. And for God to produce the words on the page, he has to exist, to be personal, uh, actually have to love us enough to communicate with us. And then the very process of inspiration, uh, again, is that God, we see this in, you know, Peter's letters and others, is that he'll he moves on certain writers at certain times, like a, a writer. It, the writer is the boat with its sails up, mm-hmm. and God, the Holy Spirit, is blowing them in the exact direction they need to do in their writing to right. say exactly what God wants them to say at that particular time and moment. Mm. That that's how yeah. the the very how the act of inspiration is taking place. And you and I, as pastors, we probably have people ask me, "Is uh, well, what would that be like?" I'll tell you, if you are a preacher or a teacher, you, you, if you've ever preached a really good sermon, that you, you did all your stuff, you prayed, and you just went through your 30, 45 minutes, and it, you know it was on autopilot. The right. words were coming out right, the, the illustrations were on, and people were, you know, people were screaming, how, how then shall I be saved after you're done? <laughs> and afterwards, you and I know, you say, boy, that sure wasn't me. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. probably something what inspiration was like, right? Yeah, you, well, you put that on steroids, and that's probably what you know the you know the the writing of the biblical books by the eyewitnesses of Christ, for example. One of the criteria uh, for uh, canonicity and inspiration is apostolicity, mm-hmm. right? Because you had twelve people who were the authoritative sp- spokespeople for Jesus Christ, who were taught by him, they could say what his teachings were and were not. So a book that was not written or approved by an apostle couldn't possibly be part of the canon or inspired. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. So we got just about five, seven minutes left. So I want to, I want to end on a really practical question because um, you know, there's so, I mean, when you turn on the news, you, you, you listen, you look at the headlines, you, know, you see like someone like Taylor Swift who, you know, says, well, I'm a Christian and you've already addressed this, this notion of false conversion. Yeah. But then she says something like, you know, uh, abortion is something that Christians should embrace and other people. And you're, you're finding this all over the place. So, I mean, can a Christian be pro abortion? Uh, um, probably a more moderate position is uh, Christians can be pro choice. Is that, is that true? No. Anything else you want to know? 
Yeah, right. Okay, well, that's what I thought you'd say. I was yeah. glad you would. But, but, yeah. but why Again, is that? I mean, does know, the Bible even talk about abortion? Yeah, I've got multiple, 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 multiple hours of lecture on this. But here are the basics, okay? And this is where all abortion arguments have to deal with. Look, let's get to the big issue of what does it mean to be a full human person made in the image of God, and when does that take place? Mm -hmm. See, because if you are a full human person, then nobody has the right or authority to murder you, to take your body parts, to do anything. You, If you're a full human person, and let's take, you know, a, a newborn toddler with the cord cut in the mother's arms, ontologically is the same being person in essence that it was five minutes before in the mother's womb. Right. Yes. Right. So the issue is, is, but see now, Unfortunately, with our our imp you know our our problematic legal system is one minute you can be a legal person with all these protections because if if after the mother bears you know the the baby moves from inside the mother's womb to outside see if if they did to the baby what they could do five minutes before in some states still where you could you could take a sharp knife, go in and cut the baby up into pieces. Right. If they did that five minutes later, they'd be guilty of, of first degree murder mm -hmm. to intentionally take the life of another human being with premeditation, malice of forethought, without mitigation, justification or excuse. That's murder. So the issue comes with when how do we know? So abortion has to deal with when is a person a full human person? Because and and that's where all the arguments come in, is that. Uh, see, in an atheist world, you're like, well, you're nothing but a body part. But even in an atheist universe where you're nothing more than your body, from the moment of conception with the zygote, you have a distinct genetic chromosome count structure DNA from the mother. Hmm. It's not mm -hmm. just part of the mother's body. So, again, all the science says physically this is different. But why? But there's no reason ever in law that we have to restrict personhood to mere physical concepts hmm. see for example we can take a we can take a, a a human cell off your body or my body that has a full a genetic code dna structure and so forth but it doesn't start self-replicating to fulfill that complete genetic code now what do we call it when a cell starts in the cell mitosis and growth and duplication start i mean that's an effect Right. That requires a cause, and it requires a direct, immediate, efficient cause, which philosophy, theology, for in every religion and every millennia says, this is the human soul, which is the ground of personhood. So this is why we can make we can make several hours of the of a great case for uh, you know personhood from conception. Right. You have a full human person from conception because you think about this based on identity, is that. From conception, when that sperm and egg come together, and now you see cell mitosis, you see the division, you see the growth, is that from the moment of conception, you can make the case that what has to be added to that one-celled conceptus or zygote to make it any more human by its essence? Mm -hmm. and the answer is nothing. All you right. add at that point is food, air, water, time, and protection and it will eventually grow to a full adult human being. Which is, by the way, that every newborn baby needs food, air, water, <laughs> time, and protection. Right. So, so there's nothing added metaphysically, ontologically, to the nature of that thing from the moment of conception. So both from the genetics, from the, from the, the physical sciences, from the theological sciences, from philosophy, it's just overwhelming evidence that you have personhood from conception. Right. So abortion, and this is why what you've got going on in the pro-life movement, what should be going on is that what you need to push are personhood amendments, uh, not only at the state level, but at the federal level, which simply you, you could, you could, I, and I, with my legal background as a law professor and advocate for these things, say, look, you literally have one sentence constitutional amendment saying a person is a full legal person from the moment of conception. Mm -hmm. And at that point, all the laws that apply to every other full human person apply to that one-celled human being.
Mm. Which means when you get to death and great bodily harm issues, the only reason that you can harm these persons are defense of self and defense of others. Right. Yeah. Right. So when do we have the right to fight back against someone? Well, because when they threaten me and threaten, you know, or threaten somebody else, I yep. can use appropriate levels of power and force to prevent them from doing that. Mm -hmm. So that's, for example, where an argument, if you have a full human person and now you've got a tubal pregnancy, mm -hmm. right? The uh, now you have a multiple five or seven day old or even a couple day old conceptus, a full human person in a stage of development that now implants in the uh, 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 fallopian tubes or the, uh, you know, well, see, now you have a problem. You have an ectopic or these other type of pregnancies. Well, mom's going to die if the baby, you know, attaches and develops there. Mm -hmm. So what do you have to do? You have to take the baby out. Currently, to my knowledge, there's no technology to save the mom and the baby. Mm -hmm. But see, at that point, you've got a self-defense argument. Hmm. It's interesting. See, so this is why, you know, if you have an infant that crawled in your house, and this is why there's a number of these legal and moral analogies. If I have an infant that crawled down the street or a toddler that ran away from mom and dad and I found them in my house, I don't have a right to kill them. Right. Yeah. Of course. I mean, and that's a, what if they're rapists? Again, if there's a toddler in my house that's the son or daughter of a rapist, do I have a right to just cut their heads off and kill them? I hope not. Right. No. <laughs> oh, okay. No. Good. If you right. take other full human persons and put that, well, yeah, but they're inside my house. So right. you have a right to kill people that enter your house? No, you have a right to self-defense and defense of others. A toddler isn't posing a threat to you. Right. Yeah, and I think the Bible is clear. Every human being is made in the image of God, right? And therefore, we need to view, to view them that way. And, you know, one thing I've asked a lot of people who, you know, are, who are struggling with this, especially on the pro-choice thing, I go, well, what's the choice between? It's to murder or not to murder, Right. And, yeah. and and if geography matters that much, and who right. has done no harm to you? And that's what the entire debate is. The entire progressive left and pro-choice and pro-abortion pro crowd, they are constantly trying to make the argument that you're not dealing with a full human person. Right. You know, you're doing the equivalent of literally, you know, taking out a, a blood clot. Yeah, right. And they yeah. have to keep telling themselves that. But to do that, they have to ignore all the evidence. Yep. For a human yep. personhood from conception. Right. And so that's why it's it's important in, in the entire abortion debate, pro-life, pro-abortion. And I don't say pro-choice because it's pro-abortion versus right. pro-life. And, mm. you know, it's like people talking about GLBTQ. No, the issue is homosexuality. Call it what it is. Right. Let them, let, let them get the sting of the term. It's It's abortion. You are killing another human being. Right. The question is whether it's justified or not. Right. Is it a justified homicide or an unjustified homicide? Yeah. Well, and I think one thing we need to remember, too, is for anyone who is watching this or listening to this and who has had an abortion, I think it's an important reminder that, as we've talked about Good Friday and what Jesus Christ has done, he died for that. He died for those sins. And there is forgiveness available to you. And Amen, there is brother. redemption and hope. Um, well, la last few thoughts, Kevin, if, sure. if someone wants to, uh, well, I mean, there's multiple ways. And again, what you, you, what you get constantly are the false accusations from the progressive left uh, on the others that, well, if you people are so pro-life, why don't you take care of every, you know, baby that, uh, you know, somehow you know, he doesn't get aborted. It's like, right. well, last time I checked, because I tell you to free the slaves doesn't mean I have to take care of all the freed slaves, number one. <laughs> sure, right. Me, uh, it's not my duty to take care of a child I produce. It's the duty of the people who produce the child. Right. You know, so you start going back to, well, if you want, so if you're so pro-life, why don't you, you know, blah, blah, take care of people. I can tell you this, there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of childless couples that want to adopt. Right. But states, unfortunately, they make adoption really hard and really expensive. Right. And what you end up with is, is sadly, is a very incentivized uh, uh, social care network where people are paid money to take in unwanted children. And it could be people who don't care about children who get, you know, in the foster system. There are a lot of great, 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 great foster people out there. 
and there are a whole bunch out there that only take them because they get a stipend from the state. Right. So on this, what's important is there are dozens and dozens and dozens of pro-life ministries and this and that, besides the fact that the law says, number one, it's like, yeah, if, if, if a woman does not want to take care of a baby, there are plenty of adoption agencies out there. They can find an, an adoption place or, or whether we even have to give start, you know, um, orphanages again, that's better than murder. Right. Absolutely. That's, that's number one to saying, well, because, you know, they have to be wanted or it's okay to murder them. Since, since Well, I don't want you around. Is it okay for me to murder you? Right. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want people with a great you, option. I don't want people with bonehead views about, you know, justice and things like that. I think it's okay to murder unborn, you know, preborn children because they're not wanted. So right. being wanted, you know, I don't want you in my society. So let's kill all the unwanted people. It, Seems it like just, we're going to get to that point in life. It doesn't it well, seem that way. Well, and, and this is why, again, it, it's bigger. You need well-informed pastors to teach the church and that what God gave biblically is that we're supposed to have good churches, good family that are Christian and a Christian government. You get the big issue of Christian nationalism. That's the big boogeyman now. Right. The fact is, is that every nation in the world up until the last 50 years was you were a Christian nation, you're an Islamic nation, you're a Buddhist nation, whoever your God was and whoever you look to for your source of morality, because law fo follows morality and morality follows religion. Right. And so and this the point is, you, there's no such thing as a true pluralistic nation. Because the, the Allah, the God of Islam, the God of the atheists, uh, the God of the pagans, and the God of Christians and Jews are different, and we have conflicting moral moral compasses and moral guidelines. You right. can't make a law of the land to which everyone can agree with conflicting religions. So thank God, at least for now, Roe v. Wade is overturned, and it's back to a state-by-state-by-state -state -by -state decision. Right. But in the end, what you need is a personhood amendment to the U.S. Constitution that says, mm -hmm. you know, all all people are all human beings are legal persons from the moment of conception for the purpose of U.S. constitutional law. Yeah. Well, I won't hold my breath for that, but I will be praying for it instead. Yeah. So, well, well Kevin, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know you took. Yeah. Time. yeah. To go there, I've got a couple of websites. Our Institute for Theology and Law site is being reworked right now. We have this right. Ancient of Days Joomla website now it's kind of fallen apart but that's itlnet.org mm -hmm. uh itlnet.org uh and again there we've, i've got some basic stuff up but the, the template's like 20 years old I have, I have a guy who's working on our brand new you know website that's going to have about 50 100 times more stuff on it but i also Great. have my personal page my uh theolaw.org t-h-e-o-l-a law Dot org like theology and law theolaw.org mm -hmm. i've got all my handouts i've got this and that so to so to get me you can you can go to those pages and uh get some of my materials and go to the youtube the institute for theology and law youtube page and i'm almost done uploading all of my key lectures on topics like this so they should be available for you and and what's great is that uh, for the thousands of dollars that I got to spend, you can get them on YouTube for free now. So thank That's you, right. Kevin. So, so generous with, with your free. time. And your so, yeah, right. Yeah, but the nice thing is I got the degree, though. Yes, you got the piece of paper. So, yes, that's and the deal. credentials. That's deal. Credentials are that's important. Right. You know, they are important. Yeah, but most important is the knowledge. Right, right. You well, know. Kevin, I can't thank you enough. I'll be uh, continuing to pray for your ministry and I'm um, encouraging you guys, go go to his website and go to the YouTube channel and interact. And if you have questions, reach out to him. But until next time, guys, share us and we'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Have a great week. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Thanks for joining us on the Faith in Real Life podcast. If you want to stay up to date on the latest content from Stand Firm Ministries, go to natcrawford.com and follow Nat Crawford on all social platforms, including YouTube and Dan Koch on Facebook. And please remember to share this podcast if you enjoy it. And while you're at it, give us a five-star rating. Until next time, remember to stand firm in the faith and stand on God's word.